Where the Stars Do Not Take Sides By Witch of Endor Chapter 7 The Darker It Gets, The More I Do I believe in you, and in our hearts we know the truth, and I believe in love, and the darker it gets, the more I do. Azula and Saka have been sitting on the deck surrounded by notes and maps for hours. It feels like they've been back and forth on the same issue, New Ozai and the risk of Governor Ukano for half a lifetime. Saka is now charting out his thoughts, plans, and backup plans for if they're betrayed. Originally, Azula didn't want anything put to ink in case their plans ever end up in the wrong hands, but the truth is that Sokka's drawings are so mad that nobody else will ever be able to decipher them. It's like its own code, Azula explains to Toph, because Toph deserves to understand the level of awful Sokka's drawings have met. Toph snickers and Sokka glares over at them. Chief Okoto usually drops by once every few hours for updates and advice, but the next time he comes over, he just looks around at them all. Aang and Katara are practicing waterbending by the edge of the ship, near enough that they occasionally voice their opinions on their plans and also on Saga's ability to chart out their plans. Where is your brother? Chief Okoto asks, frowning down at them in the sunshine. I can never seem to track him down. Zuko does join them occasionally, but he always manages to disappear with an appropriate excuse before Chief Hakoda arrives. Yeah, maybe don't do that, Azula suggests. Chief Hakoda hesitates and then sits on the deck with them. If he's avoiding you, you should just let him. He's not avoiding you, Katara insists, wandering over from where she has been practicing waterbending with Aang. He's working, and I, I think he said something about fixing a plumbing issue? Why is he working? Chief Hagoda asks. He likes to be busy, Katara explains. Azula stares up at her, wondering if she should shed light on that situation. Do you think I should talk to him? Chief Hagoda asks Azula, looking very serious. I know I scared him, but it seems like every time I talk to him it gets worse. It's private, right? And the others know enough that they should understand. Zuko did tell them all... Azula? Azula looks over at Aang, who is wearing a concerned expression as he watches her. Azula leans back and sighs dramatically. You're all making it weirder than it needs to be, she says. Just leave him alone and let him work. It makes him feel safer. Safer? Chief Akoda asks, and Azula is annoyed at herself for not just saying better. They would have accepted better. Why does working make him feel safer? Azula eyes them all. This should be more obvious to all of you. Well, it's not, Fire Hazard. Toph knocks Azula's leg with her foot, and Azula flicks a lazy flame in her direction of response. Hakoda just wants to know what to do about the whole oops, you thought I was going to hit you situation. Spill. Okay, I advise you to leave it alone and stop prying, Azula says. You make him uncomfortable, and that probably isn't going to change while you're on the ship, because you hold the most leverage. Hence the working. Chief Akoda is staring at her like she's a puzzle. I think you're going to have to walk me through that. They should be able to work this out for themselves, just like Azula did. And Zuko hasn't actually told her any more than anyone else. So it's not a breach of trust to explain it to them, she decides, especially if it helps them to stop treading on Zuzu's stupid toes. It's really not that complicated, Azula insists. Zuko has spent years working for food, or a bed, or whatever he needs. So he works, he gets paid, he goes. And he doesn't do that in a different order, because if he gets paid first, then he has this idea that they have the leverage to demand more from him. And, well, it's not always more work. At the blank looks of Zuko's friends, she adds, He did tell us this. Remember? Katara said that he would do absolutely anything in exchange for a meal, and he got all offended. Oh, says Chief Akoda, the only person who wasn't actually there for that conversation. He looks a little ill. But... Reality, Azula finishes for him. You think a pretty damaged kid, like him, didn't get propositioned a few times? Told that he owes something he doesn't want to give? Had the promise of a warm bed held over his head as long as he's willing to want... Also, well, that's enough, Tifa Gota says, but it isn't firm. It sounds more like he doesn't want a year anymore. 
Yakti Vagoda rubs at his forehead and then curses under his breath. I don't understand, Ang says. What do you mean, something he doesn't want to give? Azula, don't, Katara says, voice sounding a little wet at the same time that Azula says, Sex, obviously. Quiet falls over them like a blanket. Aang is staring at her, wide-eyed. Azula thinks they're being way too dramatic. I'm not saying he did, Azula presses. I think he made it pretty clear that he would rather miss meals. I'm saying that he obviously has a thing about people holding leverage over him. So he'd rather work before being paid so that he understands the trade. But nobody told him what he's doing on the ship and he's eating and sleeping in a bed. I don't owe you that. Saka mumbles under his breath and Azula looks at him. Saka shakes his head looking away from her and glaring at nothing. Hakoda lifts his head from his hands and looks at Azula despairingly. Do you think he actually thinks? Probably not. Azula responds. I mean, not consciously, but he's used to operating that way. There's no harm in letting him work and you get labor out of it. Let him chop potatoes and tie knots. What does it matter? There's a long pause as everyone digests this. Katara looks close to tears. Azula rolls her eyes. Look, he's also clearing out your crew playing cat's eye every night. He's fine. Just leave him alone and, I don't know, maybe don't hit on him. The chief drops in on their evening game. Zuko tenses up immediately and wonders if he should be working. The chief won't know that he's putting in work if he keeps catching Zuko training and playing five card cat eye, right? I'm not falling for that again, Pac says from next to him, scowling. Don't know your oh no, my cards are so bad routine when your cards are always better than mine, Zuko. I wasn't, Zuko starts, but he doesn't really know how to finish that sentence. The chief looks over at him and nods, but his eyes don't linger. Instead, he seems to be content with watching his crew play cards. Nobody else seems concerned that they've been caught playing. Zuko tries to make himself relax. The chief is probably just here socially. It probably has nothing to do with Zuko. Zuko looks back to his cards and rethinks his strategy because it's clear that at least two of his opponents are waiting on a card that he's holding. If he shifts from the cat shark to the camel cat or the catafant, then he doesn't lose out that much in terms of gameplay and he can hold both of them back from progressing. But Zuko isn't sure which to go for because he's been playing a different game thus far. Zuko takes a drink while he considers his options. What are you drinking? Chief Agoda asks. Zuko hesitates for a moment, unhappy with the attention, and then looks down at his cup. He looks over to Fuck. What am I drinking? He asks. As bag of fruit liquor, Pac explains, glaring at his own cards. He glances up at the chief. We cut it with watermelon juice, don't worry. We're not getting him drunk and taking all our money back. We're not taking all our money back at all, apparently. Amaruk growls. I have up a mind to burn you. Sore loser. Blank snickers. The chief is frowning down at them. You shouldn't be giving him alcohol. He's too young to be drinking. Oh, come on, Chief is a prince. He was probably raised on plum wine, Pac insists. Plus, it actually hasn't affected his gameplay yet. So you are trying to get me drunk and take your money back? Zico asks, abandoning a card he knows nobody wants. There's grumbling from around the table. I'll give you your money back once you've earned it. Come on, someone has to at least have a bumble kitten by now. Let's get this thing moving. Chief Akoda leans in and Zuko tenses up for a moment before he realizes that the chief is confiscating his drink. No more liquor, he insists. Not for the other kids either. They're too young to be drinking on my ship. Zuko wants to glare, but he also doesn't want to be caught glaring, so he watches Yuka swap out a guard. It's an obvious distraction. He doesn't even need that sweet, let alone that guard. Chief, Baka complains. Mm. I'll get you some watermelon juice, Yuko, Chief Hakoda says, leaving the room to head back into the kitchens. Ha! <laughs> Yuka says, pointing his free head towards Zuko. You're too much of a kid for the chief to let you have a little drink. Zuko scowls. Not too much of a kid to know that you're not getting that caterfly you're aiming for, Yuka. He says. The whole table lets out a quiet, mm-hmm. and Yuka looks furious. How do you know my hand? You are cheating! 
Paying attention to what you're throwing isn't cheating, Zuko says, and then looks back to his own cards and hesitates. He looks up at Pac. Is it? Pac shakes his head. You're impossible! Chief Okoda returns with Zuko's new drink before long, and Zuko doesn't think that he should drink it, but he also thinks that the chief's reaction at being rebuffed might be worse than the risk. So he drinks, mourns that it doesn't taste as spicy without the dragon flute liquor, and then returns to the game. The chief hovers, but he hovers where Zuko can see him, so it could be worse. This time, the game is a bit of a challenge, since Yuka and Nunnerjurk both gave up on the idea of winning and just set out to take Zuko down. But Zuko is the reigning champion, and he is determined to defend his title. Zuko throws his cards down and grins at the table. And that is a catafant, he declares. The table groans. What do you got? Yuka throws his cards at Zuko instead of onto the table. Can we play in teams next time? Pac asks, shaking his head. You'd be on my team, right, Zuko? Why don't we try a different game? Zuko suggests. You could teach me something and earn some of your coins back. Boo! Amaru responds. We don't stop until someone wipes the floor with this royal brat. Chief Akota straightens up. Are you done for the night, Zuko? He asks. I wanted to walk with you and have a conversation, if you don't mind. Zuko minds a lot. But he thinks that if he insists on another game, the chief might just hover and make him too nervous to enjoy it anyway. He nods, giving up his space at the table. See you tomorrow night, kid! Yuka says already, kneeling the next hand. Try hitting your head and training to give us a chance, okay? I'll do my best. Zuko replies and waves as he leaves the room. Chief Okoda follows, putting space between them in the corridor. Zuko breathes through it and waits to hear what the chief wants. Zuko, he says, looking ahead instead of at Zuko. I wanted to apologize. Apologize? For what? Zuko asks, hoping that it isn't an apology in advance. Chief Okoda shakes his head. I've been making you nervous and I can't figure out how to stop making you nervous. He admits, I just want you to know that you're safe here. The men like you. You've been helpful and they like playing cards with you. My kids like you and Toph and Aang. And you have your sister. Zuko isn't following at all. Okay. And I know we can't ever really be safe. Chief Okoda adds, not in a war like this, but nobody here is interested in hurting you. I just want to make sure that you know that. He glances at Zuko, barely turning his head. Everyone here wants you to be safe. Okay. Zuko repeats, slightly off balance. And if you want to keep working, well, it's appreciated, Hakoda adds. But it's not necessary. The other kids don't do much around the ship. You're all planning a war, after all. We're here to help you with that. You don't need to be here to help us with the ship. But, but if you want to, it's fine. I just want you to know that nobody expects it, and nobody is going to ask you to do anything to pay for your time here. Zuko stops walking for a moment, and Hakoda takes a few steps ahead before turning back with a light frown. Zuko swallows. I'm, um, Zuko starts. I'm sorry that I assumed you were going to hit Sokka. Chief Hakoda's expression softens. I'm sorry that you assumed that too, he says. But I understand why you would in your position. I wouldn't hurt Sokka or Katara, and I won't hurt you or your friends or any kids at all. That's obviously not true, and Zuko can't figure out why Chief Hakoda would say it. What if they deserved it? Children don't deserve pain, Chief Okoda says, voice firm. Sometimes things hurt because they have to, like medicines can. But children don't deserve violence, especially not from the people who are supposed to keep them safe. Anyone who told you otherwise... He pauses, clears his throat. Anyone who made you believe otherwise is wrong. Zuko wavers, feeling a little trapped in the corridor with the chief's eyes boring into him. There's a part of Zuko that thinks he can't mean this, and there's another part that reminds him, well, you don't believe that any child deserves violence, and how many children have you cared for? Maybe Chief Hakoda feels the same way. Chief Hakoda turns and starts walking again, gesturing for Zuko to follow. He does, but he feels a little dazed doing so. They head to the room Zuko shares with Azula, but Azula isn't there yet when they arrive. 
Zuko purses his lips, hoping that the chief is planning to stay. That's all I wanted to say, Chief Hakoda finishes. I hope that you can try to believe me. He looks at Zuko for a long moment, and then nods and turns to leave. Zuko lets out a long, slightly shaky breath. That was weird. Zuko starts spending more time with them on Beck. It's still mostly Saka and Azula doing the planning, whether or not the group or Chief Hakoda or Hakoda second in command decide to get updates and offer help. But it's nice to have Zuko there, sitting in the sunshine, wearing Fire Nation reds with his hair up in a neat top knot. She won't admit it, but it's even kind of nice to see the twisting braid that Guitar put there. Zuko wasn't wearing it loose and beaded in the Water Tribe style, and instead has it tucked up into his top knot. but when his hair catches the sun, it's a visible set of woven strands. And Azula notices that Zuko doesn't immediately take off whenever Chief Hakoda is on deck anymore. He doesn't relax, either, and certainly doesn't put his back to anything but the side of the boat. But there's a shift in the air, and for once, it isn't for the worse. We have a plan. Pac shouts from across the deck. Zuko looks up, surprised. He isn't sure that he's ever seen Pac in daylight hours before. The plan is a card cat tie. Zuko scowls. The plan is to give yourself a headache. A card cat tie can't work. You just wait, Fire Nation. We're coming for you. That kind of threat would have made Zuko tense up a week ago. Now it makes him roll his eyes with affection. He turns to Katara and says, It really can't work. They haven't done the math properly. It's actually kind of a lot for Zuko. Between Azula, the rest of the group, training with Aang, the near nightly card games, and working during the day, it's a lot of people. Zuko is used to solitary. He's used to finding somewhere to sleep by himself and staring at the stars in the quiet or being tucked into the corner of someone else's home while they ignore him. But this ship is never quiet. Someone is always talking to him, and while well, it's usually good, productive, or even amusing... It's also a lot. It ends up being too much late one afternoon, and all Zuko can think about is finding somewhere to be alone. But if he goes to the room he shares with Azula, someone might come looking for him, and there seem to be people everywhere else. Between working and playing cards, most of the crew know him at this point. Zuko feels a jolt of panic when he realizes that he can't escape. He can't be alone. And then he finds himself crawling into a space between boxes and pipes near the back of the ship. It's outside, but nobody can see him from this angle. He's cramped, stuck with his back pressed uncomfortably against the edge of a box, but he's alone. He can still hear chatter, the noise of the ship, the crash of the waves. Zuko covers his ears and closes his eyes. He doesn't know how long he's there or whether he maybe falls asleep, but when he feels like he's come back to himself, it's dark. Zuko breathes deeply and steadily and calls a flame to his hand for a few moments of meditation. It helps him feel more steady in his body and less like he's floating away somewhere on the waves. He doesn't want anyone to think that he's ungrateful. This might be the best his life has ever been or ever will be. But it's just all so a lot. The sky continues to get darker and Zuko finds himself slowly relaxing. And then he hears footsteps by his hiding place in a pause, and then a hesitant, Zuko? Zuko puts the flame out, realizing that it's given him away. Hi, Saka. Saka's face appears between two pipes. Hey, I was looking for you. I brought you some dinner. When you didn't turn up, I assumed you were working. Zuko tenses, and Saka seems to notice because he adds, Not because I think you should be working, just because that's where you tend to disappear to. Zuko waits a moment, and then nods. Thank you. Should I leave it with you? Saka asks, raising the plate. Do you want to be alone? And Zuko finds himself suddenly crushingly grateful that Saka had known his that and wants to respect it. But he's also been alone for hours now and thinks that he might be ready for some company. No, it's... I did need to be alone. But I think I'm okay now. Saka looks at him for a long moment and then smiles and nods. Great, he says, and Zuko is readying himself to stand and leave his hiding place, but before he gets a chance, Saka is climbing in. Oh, wow, you found the smallest place on the whole ship, huh? Zuko shifts and Saka places the plate and cup of water on a low box next to him before sitting in the only spare inches of space available. 
they can't avoid touching like this and their legs end up a little tangled, but it's kind of comfortable. So guess what? Saga asks as Zuko picks up his plate. Your psycho sister finally admitted that my plan is good. We're en route to meet with two of the Daily now. It looks like the day after tomorrow, we'll have to leave the warriors behind because we don't want word getting out about how we're disguising ourselves. Zuko lets Saka update him and listens, nodding as he eats. There's something comforting about hearing Saka make plans because Saka's mind is wonderful, but it's also a little overwhelming after hours without any words. And there have been so many days on the ship now that the idea of leaving, of moving this war forward closer to having to return to the palace, it's all a little much. He feels like he's perched right on the edge of everything ending, like when he was in a good situation and watching the days count down until he had to leave. Zuko puts the plate back onto the box when he's done and lets himself watch Sokka trying to tune out the details. It doesn't take long for Saga to notice. Sorry, Saga says, sheepish. You were probably trying to escape all this, huh? Not you specifically, Zuko replies. It's just... He tries to figure out how to explain himself. Um, for a long time, I was always by myself, you know? Even when I was working with people, I wasn't usually really with them. Saga nods, watching him intently. It's getting darker now. They're on the eastern side of the ship, so the sunset is blocked from them, and it's just the fading blue in the sky giving them light. The light plays on Saga's skin, the shape of his cheekbones and his jaw, and it's almost painfully beautiful. So now there's a whole bunch of people who want to talk to you all the time, Saga continues. That's got to be intense, right? Zuko nods. It was already hard when it was just you guys. Are you sure you don't want me to go? Saka asks, or I could sit here and be quiet with you. Zuko doesn't want Saka to go, but he is still feeling a little raw. Maybe quiet would be good, he suggests, and Saka nods and sits back a little. And then Zuko adds, Thank you. Saka smiles at him, quiet as promised, and Zuko can't quite see the bright blue of his eyes in the diminishing glow of sunsets. But they have a clearness to them, like he's looking right into Zuko's soul and he doesn't mind what he's seeing there. Zuko reaches out, planning to touch Saga's arm in another silent moment of thanks. The others do this sometimes, use physical contact instead of words. And Zuko was starting to get used to it, starting to understand its significance. But he misses and doesn't realize until his fingers land on skin instead of cloth. He wavers for a moment, unsure of whether he should pull back, and then Sokka turns his hand over and slots their fingers together. Something in Zuko relaxes in the quiet. And part of him says, stop throwing yourself at someone who doesn't want you, idiot. But another part of him is content to just be here right now because he'd somehow never known just how good it can feel to touch Sokka's hand. And he doesn't want the moment to end. They sit there for a long time, skin against skin, cramped into a tiny hiding place, resting in the quiet. But eventually they have to retire, and Zuko's legs are starting to ache anyway. Saka doesn't let go of his hand when he stands, uses it instead to help Zuko to his feet. And then they're standing between boxes and pipes, and there isn't really any room to not be close, and... And Zuko meets Saka's eyes. They're of a height, and it's obvious this close. It's gotten darker again, and Zuko can almost feel Saka more than he can see him. Zuko swallows, and he can feel Saka's breath. And they are just so close. But last time this happened, Saka pushed him away and wiped at his mouth. Zuko clearly can't read whether or not Saka wants this. Hat thought he wanted Zuko when he maybe kind of did. Assumed he wanted Zuko when he was disgusted by the idea... So he stays very still, and he looks at Saka, and he wills Saka to make himself clear somehow. Saka stares back at him just as unmoving. His eyes flicker away from Zuko's, but only to sweep over Zuko's face before returning. Zuko can feel his own heartbeat heavy and quick in his chest, and they're so close that he wonders if Saka can feel it too. Their hands are still together, Zuko realizes. Their fingers are still wound. Saka's skin is warm and soft. 
Zuko finds himself tightening his grip, but Dutch and Saka draws a small breath at that and wavers forward. There's barely any space between them. If Zuko presses forward just slightly, tilts his head just a little, they'll be kissing. But he waits for Sokka, and for a moment he's sure that he knows what's about to happen. And then Zaka blinks, and his eyebrows pull in a little, and then he's pulling away. Sokka's hand drops from Zuko's. Well, Zuko thinks that answers that question. Azula is brushing her hair when her brother turns up, apparently having been walked to their room by Saka. Azula sighs internally, already halfway through making plans about the legal ramifications of that mess. Maybe she can spin that a royal union between the Fire Nation and the Water Tribes can be used as a sign of goodwill between the peoples? Finally, Azula grumbles. I'm taking first watch. Azula always takes first watch because she can't trust Zuko to sleep. Otherwise, the idiot would guard her all night if given half a chance. Saka frowns at her, and then at Zuko. First watch? What, you've forgotten how watches work? Azula asks, retying her hair. I take first, he takes second. I beat him up on deck in the morning. Yeah, but... Saka looks from her to Zuko again, and there's some awkward tension there that Azula isn't poking with a tampon ball unless it proves to be amusing to do so. Why is anyone taking watches at all? You know we have people guarding the ship in case anything happens, right? There's a long pause. Azula waits for recognition to dawn on Saka's face because it's obvious why they're taking watches. But it never comes. Uh... Zuko says, rubbing the back of his neck. We're sort of just guarding ourselves. This room, I mean. Then Saka's expression changes. He goes from confused to offended to a little sad. You two still think you're not safe here. We don't know everyone on the ship. Zuko points out voice low and reassuring. It's not about someone in particular. You just never know. She notes that the pair of them aren't quite meeting one another's eyes. Maybe it would be fun to pull that tension. Saka's face has solidified into determination. Okay, he says, so let me have first watch. Azula and Zuko rise with the sun. Katara is outside their bedroom door. That was underhanded, Azula says to Katara, who only smiles back at her. When Azula reestablishes contact with the Dai Li, she has her own small army of children. They are, however, possibly the most dangerous children in the world. Sokka insists that they arrive hours early and scope out the entire plane. There will be no room for hiding unless it is created. The water is to their backs and Appa is nowhere in sight, but Sokka is armed with a bison whistle should they need it. Zuko stands to her right, swords drawn. Chief Hakoda does not like this plan. It has taken a lot of time and determination to get it past him, but Azula has reminded him firmly on multiple occasions that this is ultimately her war. He gets this look on his face whenever she says it, a little sad and strained. Two daily agents approach, exactly as planned. It turns out that they didn't need to be quite so concerned about being betrayed, but Azula thinks it's good practice anyway. Ba Sing Se is Azula's. We can't use the whole army, Saga admits later when they're back on the ship. We can, Azula contradicts him and then shrugs. But we shouldn't, I agree. There's too much room for news getting out, too many informants, too much possibility of an internal conflict. But we have the agents, and we can use them for the battle or for a distraction. Saka is leaning over a map when Azula catches her brother, watching him from across the deck where he's knotting ropes for some mysterious ship-related reason that Azula doesn't care to know about. Azula almost glares at him because there are so many political ramifications, which nobody but Azula seems to care about, but that's before she realizes that her brother mostly just looks sad. Sad and wistful and resigned, and Azula doesn't like that expression at all. So, how exactly did you upset Zuzu? Azula asks casually. 
Saka hesitates and then looks over to where Zuko is working. Zuko starts and turns away. Saka's jaw tightens. I, um, I didn't mean to. Azula feels her own expression settling into something dangerous. Tuck! I might have almost kissed him a few nights ago. Saka admits head ducked and cheeks dusted with pink. But I didn't. But I'm pretty sure he knows that I was thinking about it, and now things are weird. Azula sits back in front of him. Huh. I thought we had a few more weeks of you two dancing around each other. Saka looks up. What do you mean? Azula gives him a flat look. I am not spelling this out for you if you haven't figured it out yet, she says annoyed. But whatever is happening, if you could stop making him look like a kicked turtle duck, that would be great. You're such a soft- Ow! Saka rubs his forehead, smoothing out the crusted shapes from her nails digging in him. Okay, you're all so sharp, he admits, like a hedge kitten. Ow! Azuna! Katara shouts from across the deck. Please don't leave any permanent damage on my brother. Saka shakes his head. Why are all the girls I know terrifying? Zuko is looking over again. He's too far away to listen in on their conversation, even with his above-average hearing, but Azula waits until he looks away. So, what happened? She demands. Saka frowns, still rubbing at his arm. I told you. When Azula only raises her eyebrows, he says, I almost kissed him. Is that a bad thing? Azula asks. Are you really bad at it? Saka screws up his nose at her, and then his expression turns confused. No, you... You said not to do that. But I already did before, when he was Lee, and it obviously screwed everything up, and he said he didn't owe me that, and then I tried to do it again, like an idiot, even though you already told us all why it's a bad idea. Okay, slow down, idiot. Azula interrupts. Start from the beginning. Saka starts from the beginning. From the actual beginning, when they met. Apparently, Zuko used to fight wearing a theater mask, which Azula files away from mocking him later. And Saka tells the longest, stupidest story, and by the end of it, Azula has heard a lot about how smart and kind her brother is, and what he looks like shirtless, and she just about wants to throw up. When Saka is done talking, he looks so miserable that it's hardly even funny. After a long pause, Azula states, That was the stupidest story I've ever heard. Saka doesn't attempt to contradict her. I won't do it again, he promises. I'm sorry, I was listening to you before, I just got caught up in the moment. You got caught up because he was holding your hand, Azula points out, and giving you pretty clear go-ahead-and-ravish-me signals. Saga winces. But you said, I stick by what I said because what I said was that your dad shouldn't hit on him. What hell, Azula? Azula holds her hands up. Chief Hakoda wanted to know how to make him relax, and not hitting on him is step one. It was good advice. When Saka just continues to look grossed out, she adds, I can't believe you're making me say this. I did not mean that nobody can ever show an interest in my brother. She draws an annoyed breath. You do know that I'm not actually planning to marry him, right? Azula! Stop being so dramatic. The only problem here is if he thinks you're trying to coerce him, which you're not. So communicate that like you're not a lovesick 12-year-old like Aang. Azula closes her eyes for a brief despairing moment. Please don't be as stupid as Aang. I can't take that. And if I throw myself overboard, you'll have to force Zuzu on the throne after all. When she opens her eyes, Saka looks hesitant. But I... He starts and then stops the frowns. I told you what he said that first time about not owing me that. Azula tilts her head in acknowledgement. You don't think he's still... Okay, I reached capacity, Azula states. If you want to know what he thinks, talk to him about it, not me. 
with me, you talk about war, not boys. War, not boys. Saga repeats, looking a little dazed. So, new Ozai, Azula prompts him. Saka never quite gets his head back in the game that afternoon. They end up flying Appa most of the way to New Ozai with plans in place for meeting up with a water trap afterwards. Meeting with the leadership here is a trickier maneuver because Azula and Saka decided that surprise is better than planning in this case since they're more likely to sell the group out. This way they have to worry about escape, but not about a planned ambush. Plus, May is in New Oza, and Azula has reason to believe that Tai Lee is with her, so they already have help escaping if they need it. Of course, things go pear-shaped, as they tend to. Azula should have known that Ma Sing Se was too simple. It's fine, we go off track all the time. Saga tells Azula, who does not appreciate this reassurance at all, especially from her strategist. Well, 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 the creepy voice of the former king calls out from his case. If it isn't, two groups converged into one. He laughs, and Azula glares. Boomy! And greets him, looking thrilled. I'm so glad that you're okay! King Boomy is Ang Ang. I see that you have found a firebending master, he says, and then keeps looking at the group. Or two! And an earthbending master, too! I have heard whispers that the avatar is nearing full strength. He has a long way to go to full strength, Azula insists, and she means it as an insult, but Aang means it her nonetheless. King Boomy looks to Azula again. Ah, I believe I have a message for you, Princess Azula, from an old friend of mine and an old lucid of yours. He laughs at himself again. Was this guy always this crazy, or is it the imprisonment? Toph asks from next to her. Azula sighs. Unfortunately, he was always like this. I believe it's time for my escape so that I can aid you in finding the White Lotus. And that changes everything. Zuko steps forward. What do you know about the White Lotus? He asks. Our uncle told us to find it, but he didn't tell us what it is. Hold on, back off. I'll get King Laughs a lot out of there. Pop says, pushing her sleeves up. Uh-huh, no need, my new friend. King Boomy insists, and then brings himself out, apparently using only his face to earth bend. Azula is already tired of this whole endeavor. You can do that this whole time? Really? She asks, unimpressed and annoyed. King Boomy stretches. I shall take you to the White Lotus camp, he says. Azula supposes that this is pear-shaped in not a completely terrible way, so she allows it, but she still needs to have an audience with Ugano. However, escaping with their king is definitely going to throw the idea of an alliance in disarray. Azula turns to Saga immediately, and they talk the situation through in low voices, eventually settling on taking the risk of being open. They have Toph with them to act as a lie detector, and between them, they have the means for escape if it becomes necessary. They hide King Boomy for the moment, leaving him with Katara for protection that he probably doesn't need, but at least she can stop him from wandering off. And the rest of the group head to the personal rooms of the governing family. It doesn't go terribly, but it also doesn't go smoothly. Dad, May insists, this is what's going to happen, whether you want it to or not. You said it yourself, without any heirs, Fire Lord Ozai's days on the throne are numbered. Uka now watches them very carefully, clearly trying to figure out where his loyalties should lie. How sure are you that you can win? He asks eventually, and Azula smiles. Azula and Saka talk circles around Ukano, and with May and Tai Lee already on their side and Ukano's wife clearly leaning in their direction, it doesn't take long. Toph stays to one side, not saying anything, but carefully nodding or shaking her head, depending on Ukano's honesty. While Azula had been concerned about Toph's presence in any diplomatic scenario in theory, in practice, Azula isn't sure how she ever managed without her. In the meantime, Zuko is predictably useless. He's spotted May's little brother, and so he spends most of the conversation sitting in the corner playing with a pile of blocks and making the child giggle. If it weren't for Zuko's posture, poised to defend them at any given moment, she would ban him from further meetings like this. I'm going with them, May declares when it looks like the conversation has been smoothed over. 
Uga no is not happy about this, but Mei is decisive and Tylee follows her with a wide-eyed expression. When Tylee is close enough, she reaches out to squeeze Azula's hand in the greeting she hasn't been able to give. Nobody needs to know that I'm gone. Just say that I'm not feeling great. Nobody needs to know about the king, either, Saga reassures Ugano, which then turns into its own thing. In the midst of arguing about whether or not Azula can take King Bumi and Ugano's daughter, Azula catches Saka watching Zuko with Tom Tom. The child is trying to climb Zuko, who is being surprisingly lenient about this turn of events, smiling softly and offering some basic support. Saka's expression is even stupider than it usually is when he looks at Zuko and, well, at least it looks like Saka won't stand in the way of Zuzu's dream to raise an heir and a few spares. The conclusion is that Ugano can't stop them from taking Mei, Tylee, and King Bumi, and Ugano is sufficiently convinced that Azula will inevitably win this war that he declares himself an ally. Toph signs off on this, and they share a very vague outline of the plan for war and communication. It's a victory in the end, but one that weighs Appa down and makes him slow. Zuko worries about Appa, who needs to rest, and about Chief Hakoda, who will be expecting them back on the ship much earlier than they will arrive. Appa flies, fortunately, but he's clearly not too happy about it. It's not even like they're very heavy, Azula grumbles, I ain't King Boomy. May shrugs. I don't know, I have a lot of knives. Tiny finally gives up on hugging Azula and rambling about how happy she is to see her and launches herself across the saddle to Zuko. Zuko freezes, got off guard, and holds still as he is embraced. So glad you're okay, Zuko, Tiny is saying, and Zuko manages a quiet uh-huh and waits to be released. Azula sighs. Let go of him, Tiny, honestly. Tiny sits back then, wiping at her eyes and memes at Azula. So we switched to sides, huh? Azula meets Zuko's eyes over Tylee's shoulder. See, I told you I have better friends than you. Katara is clearly giving up to argue about this when Tylee looks around the crowded saddle, smiling and introducing herself. When her eyes land on Saka, she pauses for a long moment and Zuko feels his heart sink. Oh, Tylee says, you're cute. She moves to say closer to Saka, and Zuko looks away. Tylee, Azula says low in warning. What's your name? Tylee asks. Zuko tries to tune them out, watching the horizon and breathing evenly. It's none of his business. He reminds himself this has nothing to do with him. His name is Saka, Azula answers for him. And you're barking up the wrong tree. Saka dances on the other side of the campfire. There's a brief moment of silence, and the top shrinks with delighted laughter. After a moment, some of the other kids join in, and Saga audibly splutters. First of all, what? Saga says. And second of all, at least be accurate in your weird Fire Nation sayings. That's not true. Zuko's heart rate picks up. He's pretty sure the top can't tell when they're sitting on Appa, for which he's thankful, but he feels his own jaw tightening and his face heating, so it's probably written all over his face anyway. But that's right, isn't it? Saka talked about Princess Yue, with whom he'd been besotted, and there was also the Kirshi warrior. Zuko feels himself curling tighter, trying to take up less space. That's... something? Humiliating, maybe, but again... None of Zuko's business, so he forces himself to calm down and not look at anyone. Tough, was that a bomb faced lie? Azula asks, voice catching somewhere between amused and annoyed. Because I think that was a bomb faced lie. Not that it's any of your business, Saga replies, sounding honestly confused. But I dance on both sides of the campfire, thank you very much. And that makes more sense, even if Zuko hadn't realized it was an option. Zuko doesn't relax much, but it's at least good to know that once wanting to kiss him isn't being written off entirely as an experience. What? Tylee asks, and her voice is filled with wonder. You can like both? Why did nobody tell me you can like both? I'm guessing because it's illegal in the Fire Nation anyway. May replies. What? Saka asks, and this time he sounds a little panicked. What do you mean illegal? 
It's Azula's turn to sigh. Don't get your wolf tail in a twist, Saga. I'm going to overturn that when I'm Fire Lord. I think maybe I like wolf too, Tiny declares, and then Zuko does turn to look at her because she's kind of his childhood friend and that's kind of a big deal. Zuko leans forward and touches her arm just for a moment and hopes that he's doing the contact instead of words think correctly. Kylie beams at him. By the time they arrive back on the ship, it's obvious that Chief Hakoda has been metaphorically, and possibly literally, biting his nails. His children run into his arms and he smiles across at the rest of the group and then hesitates. Well, you told me we might get to more Fire Nation girls, but you seem to have an addition again. King Boomy laughs loudly. The group gets to work on planning. The bison needs to rest before they go anywhere, and the bison will be able to take the whole group to the camp. They will need to leave some people behind to arrive with the Water Tribe warriors. It's annoying to have to lose May and Tai Lee so quickly after regaining them, but it won't take long to be reunited, and they can look after one another on the way. It takes Azula a few moments to realize that Zuko has frozen by her side. When she looks over at him, it's to find him looking back at her with wide eyes. Azula frowns and tilts her head in question, and Zuko takes a deep breath and says quietly and very carefully, I would prefer not to be separated. Azula waits for understanding to dawn, but it doesn't come. To be separated from whom? She asks, and then thinks through the people he likes on the ship. Presumably he's not this anxious about losing his card game buddies. Chief Hakoda? What? Zuko asks, frowning. No, I mean you. And that's maybe a little sweet, which Azula will never admit. But it's also confusing. Why would you be separated from me? Zuko blinks. Because you're leaving some people behind. Azula looks to the heavens. You're not one of those people, dummy, she states. You go where I go, obviously. Oh, Zuko replies and then visibly relaxes. Okay. Why would you even think otherwise? Zuko shrugs. I'm not as necessary as the others, he says, like it's obvious. You're generally useless, yes. Azula replies, trying to keep the irritation she's feeling out of her voice because she can't be the one to tell him that he's important. But nobody else is listening closely enough to know that they should say it. Ah! But you're not specifically useless. Azula isn't sure that makes sense. And Zuko doesn't look like he thinks it makes sense either. But it will have to do. Zuko isn't getting any more out of her. Pak finally unveils a guard get time that night. The rules don't seem to make any sense, but Pak declares himself the winner anyway. And Zuko laughs, which Pak also claims as a victory. Hey, man. Pak says when it's time for bed, look after yourself out there. I still need to beat you at five cards at some point. Zuko holds himself back from smiling. And then he stops holding himself back. Chief Akoda is weird about them all leaving again. Azula stands to one side with Zuko and says goodbye to Mei and Tai Lee, but she has half an eye on the chief. He hugs his children no less than twice, and also hugs Toph and Aang, and then claps King Bumi on the shoulder while having what looks like a very serious conversation. She even sees him pat Momo and Appa. So it's obvious what is coming next. Azula shifts closer to Zuko because she's almost completely certain that he will have an actual heart attack if Chief Hakoda tries to hug him. He looked spooked enough by Tai Lee yesterday, and Tai Lee has probably hugged him more than anyone aside from Mother. When Chief Hakoda approaches them, pulling their attention away from the Fire Nation girls, Azula levels him with a stare. Hopefully, I'll see you again in a few days, Chief Hakoda says, looking serious. But this is wartime. We can't predict what will happen. He lifts his big hands and settles them very gently, one on Azula's shoulder and the other on Zuko's. Azula tenses and feels Zuko tense beside her, but Chief Hakoda stays at arm's length. So I want to tell the two of you how incredibly proud I am. Azula blinks. She looks to Zuko to see if he understands, but Zuko looks just as bewildered. Sir? Zuko asks. The two of you have come extraordinarily far. The chief explains. You've gone from the next in line to the throng. He nods to Azula. 
out of runaway just trying to keep himself safe to deciding to, well, deciding to save the world. Nothing about that could have been easy, but you did it anyway. Azula swallows, and she isn't sure why she needs to, but she suddenly feels a little overwhelmed. And I am so proud. Echo to finishes. Azula tries to steady her breathing. Why is she being like this? She's made people proud before. She's proud of herself most days because there's a lot to be proud of. She's been praised and assured and looked up to. She has no idea why Hakoda's warm gaze is doing this to her. Oh, Zuzu says, and he sounds faint. Thank you, sir. Chief Hakoda keeps looking between them for a moment and then squeezes their shoulders. I know I don't need to tell you to look after one another, he notes. You're already doing an amazing job of that. But maybe let other people look after you sometimes, too. With that, he leaves, and Azula and Zuko stare after him. That was... Zuko starts, and Azula shakes her head. Yes, she responds. It was. They fly for hours. King Bumi sits at the front of the saddle with Aang, chatting away about what Azula understands to be nothing of importance. Zuko carefully sews up a tear in Toph's sleeve, while Toph sits with her head on the saddle and her feet dangling off the side. The water tribe's siblings bicker. Azula's stomach hasn't quite settled since Hakoda's weird speech, but she feels oddly content to just sit back and watch them all. They arrive at the White Lotus camp and are greeted by a familiar face. Master Piandao? Piandao approaches them slowly, eyes flickering between Zuko and Azula, and then bows deeply. Your Highnesses, he greets. It is an honor. Rise, Azula states, and Piandao stands again. Zuko's breath has gone a little loose in his chest. Piandao stares at him, wide-eyed, and then offers him a small smile. Prince Suko, he says eventually, it is truly one of the great pleasures of my life to see you again. Zuko swallows and then offers his own bow in return. I owe you much. What you taught me has kept me safe for many years. He rises and sees that Pian Dao is eyeing the sword strapped to his back. It is good to see that you have stuck with the craft, he says. You always had a great talent for the Dao swords. You should see what I can do with them now, Saga interjects, grinning. Zuko invented firebending from swords. It's awesome. Piandao's eyebrows shoot up. I had heard rumors, he admits. The conversation turns then, thankfully, with Azula standing before the group and Piandao explaining the order of the White Lotus. Prince Iroh is on his way to join them, as are the Water Tribe warriors, and the group have been welcomed to use the secret camp as a base and to use the White Lotus as allies. Zuko is aware that Azula and Saka have put a lot of work into planning, and he's also aware that they're only semi-confident in their ability to win, even if both of them put on a good front. This will make a big difference. When the group starts to disperse, ready to be shown their tent and the dining area, Pian Dao approaches Zuko again. I have heard rumors of your survival for weeks now, Pian Dao says, but I didn't know whether or not to believe them until Prince Iroh sent word to us. Zuko only nods because he doesn't think there's much more to say. Whispers are fast spreading in the Fire Nation, much as the Fire Lord would like to keep this under wraps. You should know that many of your people are eager to see their prince return. Zuko nods again, unsure how to respond. He's glad that Saka is stuck by him, because between this and the conversation with Chief Akoda earlier, Zuko is feeling off balance. Thank you, he says eventually. So, you taught Zuko his sword fighting? Saka asks. He called you master. Are you a sword fighting master? I am indeed, Pian Dao responds. Prince Zuko came to me for lessons as a child. Saka nods. You must be really good. I've been wondering about picking up a close-range weapon in time for the battle. If we have time, do you think you could show me a few things? Pian Dao eyes Saga for a long moment. What makes you believe you are worthy? Zuko watches as Saga stands wilts and as he looks away. Yeah, I guess I'm not, he admits. 
Zuko does his best not to keep his gaze from Pian Dao because he's pretty sure that if he does, Pian Dao will see him look furious! And Zuko knows that he has some power here, that Pian Dao thinks that his status is meaningful, and he doesn't want to throw that power around. Hmm. Pian Dao is silent for another moment and then says, What was your name? Sokka. Sokka replies, I'm from the Southern Water Tribe. Will, Saka of the Southern Water Tribe, Pian Dao continues, we will begin at dawn. Saka looks up, his blue eyes sparkling and bright. Pian Dao offers him a small smile before turning to leave. Saka looks to Zuko, then radiant and ecstatic, and Zuko finds himself smiling back. Zuko reaches out to touch because he's pretty sure that he's getting the contact instead of words thing, and his fingers find Saka's sleeve. Saka turns his hand and grasps Zuko's, and the two of them stand there together for a long moment. Azula is pleased with this turn of events, up to their first attempt at a meeting. There are a half dozen members of the Order of the White Lotus, all aged men, and it becomes quickly apparent that they are comfortable with Azula's allies. I mean no offense, one of the men states. But it is most unusual to have children in a war council. Azula looks up and she knows her eyes are flashing. Excuse me? Princess, of course you must remain. It is, after all, your war council. Another member corrects. But perhaps the other children can retire for the night. In the corner of her eye, Azula can see Katara gearing up the shout. Azula holds up a hand, trying to hold her off, and Katara hesitates. Azula stands. Gentlemen, she says, staying very calm, it appears that I need to make something clear. She looks to the last man who had spoken and inclines her head. You are correct that this is my war council, she states. On this side of the war, every council is my council, Every strategy is my strategy, and every ally is my ally. We must no fudge, the first member repeats, and Azula turns her head to level a glare at him. I am not a pawn in your war, Azula declares because she realizes that it is long past time to make this abundantly clear. You are not fighting a war and then putting me on the throne to your bidding. I am fighting a war for the dragon throne and you are allies to my cause. My cause, which includes ending this war and freeing your people. There is a long moment of silence. Azula is pleased that nobody dares to speak up this time. I choose who is in this room, not you. And before you deem this simply the whim of the next Fire Lord, I will remind you of who the children are that you are insinuating do not belong here. Azula begins on her left. The Avatar, who is almost at full strength at twelve years of age, even though Avatars do not typically begin training until they are sixteen. Ang beams, which rather undermines Azula's point, but she ignores him. To top, who is smirking. The greatest earthbender in the world, inventor of metal bending, also at 12 years of age, master and teacher of the Avatar. Katara looks up at Azula with wide eyes. The only waterbender of the Southern Water Tribe, a prodigy in her craft, master and teacher of the Avatar. Saka appears to be avoiding Azula's gaze. My chief strategist, the mastermind behind this entire war. Saga looks up then, something shifting on his face. And finally, at her right hand, Zuzu. The Phoenix Prince, inventor of armed firebending, master and teacher of the Avatar, my brother. She turns now to the rest of the council. Which of these children would you see banished from this room? Because I assure you, if given the choice between allying myself with them or with you, you will not be pleased with the results. Silence falls. Azula meets every eye that is turned towards her and then nods before taking her seat. Continue, she orders. Once the meeting is in session again, Azula realizes that Aang still hasn't stopped being at her. 
What? She asks under her breath. Aang shakes his head. You're going to be a great fire lord, Azula, he responds. 